Well, good morning. So this morning we're going to be talking about sex. Um, if that doesn't get your attention, I got nothing else that can get your attention. Um, if you have a small child in here, I will not be descriptive. I will not be gratuitous. I'm not going to be inappropriate, but I am going to use some terms. I'm going to use three terms that you may have to explain later. Um, one of the terms is the word sex. One of the words is adultery. And the other one is the word lust. And um, I don't need to be descriptive because you're an adult and you know what I mean. But if your child doesn't know and you don't want to explain it at lunch, I'm just giving you a heads up that we're going to be talking about that today. Um, you probably should have known that because after all, we're working through the seven deadly sins and this is lust this week, right? So you probably anticipated that it was coming because I know you all woke up and opened your notes this morning, you read ahead and you were ready to go and, and prayed up and you're waiting for God to speak to you. And I'm gonna make you a promise this morning. My promise to you this morning is that this is going probably to make you feel uncomfortable, not because of the words I say or the descriptions or anything else, but because nothing is more personal, nothing Nothing is more private. Nothing is more anti-cultural. Nothing is more difficult than you making the right and correct biblical decisions regarding your body and your mind. And we find that God is exceptionally concerned about these things. And there's some reasons why he's concerned. So we are working through the series on the seven deadly sins. As I've said to you before, not a biblical definition that God gave, uh, Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's historical, seven different things that we may want to examine in our lives to make sure that we're not exposed, but they are biblical themes and certainly helpful for us. And so we are on week number four, and th that is the week where we're going to be talking, or this is the week where we're going to be talking about lust. Now, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. The author of Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs, my goodness, uh, he talked about this a lot and how dangerous it was and how it was important for us to protect our mind. Proverbs chapter six is a great uh, chapter for you to read if you're interested in this kind of stuff. And you can see some great imagery about the benefits of maintaining God's standard and being pure with your eyes. But in Proverbs chapter six, uh, the author of Proverbs here, he says, do not lust in your heart after her beauty or even and let her captivate you with her eyes. And the literal translation of this kind of cracked me up because it means eyelashes or maybe eyelids. And so back in the day, uh, someone could captivate you by batting their eyes at you and having eyelashes that were suggestive. Now it is a totally different world we live in. Eyelashes, eyelids, are you kidding me? We've gone well past that to where very little is left to the imagination. No matter where you are, at the mall, at the gym, at school, anywhere else. I mean, we have sort of devolved. I almost look back at the days of Proverbs and go, man, wouldn't it be simple back then? But it wasn't. And it's not simple now. In our city groups this morning and going on across the property here right now as I'm talking, our city groups are discussing this idea of lust. What is lust? When does a look become a linger? They're talking about the first time, if at all, that their parents or someone had a conversation with them about sex, the talk, and what that was all about, how that went. And I wish I was in every one of these groups because it would be really fun, I think, to be a part of those conversations and to learn and to listen. But one of the questions they're gonna be discussing is, if I wanted to ruin someone's life with lust, this is what I would do. If I wanted to ruin my own life with lust, this is how I would live. These are the actions that I would partake in. These are the thoughts that I would think. This is where I would allow my mind to go and my heart to dwell. And I could give you a long, long, long list. And I won't because you're a creative person who lives in the same world as I do. And you have your own list. And if I gave you my list, you would look at my list and check some things off because they may not apply to you and think you're okay. When in reality, you're the only one who can govern your own mind and your own thoughts with the help of the Holy Spirit of God and a strong resolve to live God's way. You can get freedom, but you have to want it more than you want anything else. Today is a day when you probably, I believe, can grow more, potentially more than any other day that we've had together since January. I have told you that beginning in January, we started a journey together of transformation, that we were gonna become more and more the people who Jesus wanted us to be, to live more and more according to God's standard, that we were going to be people in December that we look back and didn't even recognize. And all I told you you had to do was to show up here on Sunday, to carve out a little time in your life for the Lord, 
to lean in a little bit to the things we're talking about, to involve God in your thoughts and your prayers throughout the week. And he would do something amazing in you. And most of you have done that and you're growing like crazy. So here's your biggest test yet. How seriously are you gonna take this issue? What decisions are you gonna make in your own life? How are you going to choose to live? We gotta kill it, lust, the lingering looks, the inappropriate thoughts, the intense and unbridled sexual desire. And I know I sound like the church lady from Saturday Night Live back in the day. I know I may sound like your grandma or your mom or your Sunday school teacher or whoever else it is that just told you to stop it, stop it, stop it, don't, 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 but never explain to you why. But God has a reason for asking you to live in a certain way. And the reason is to free you and to bring you peace in your life that you cannot experience in any other way. And you have to choose whether you trust him or you trust yourself, plain and simple. I have chosen in my life to trust God, but it doesn't mean that in any of these areas, any of the seven we talk about, this one included that potentially I'm not able to be tempted just like our pastor Dan, our church staff, our deacons. We are people. And this is one of those areas that if we aren't really, really vigilant, Satan can get you. Now, I don't want to scare you too badly. That's just introduction. But the introduction of sex uh, happened in Genesis chapter two, and it's in your notes, uh, Genesis chapter two, when Adam took a nap, he had uh, been busy naming all the animals and your notes can be found on your app on a PDF. And uh, he had, you know, just named all the animals. He'd seen, you know, rhinoceri and hippopotamus and elephant and zebra and trying to think of names for all of them. He was tired, he went into a deep sleep and the Bible tells us that that God created Eve from one of his ribs. When God created Eve, he didn't create an employee, he didn't create a servant, he didn't create somebody that was substandard, he created a partner. He created somebody that was supposed to complement Adam that together, now listen to this, together in a committed marriage relationship and theirs was an arranged marriage, wasn't it? They didn't have any choices. They're the only two people. God said, wake up, here you go. And she was perfect for him, right? You get to choose which can both be bad and good. Isn't it crazy that one of the most important decisions we make in our life, we make it before we're really able to make good decisions? I mean, that, it's just the way it is. By the grace of God, you know, it's scary. I mean, there are a lot of things you'd trust a 22-year-old with, but I mean, choosing a life partner, are you kidding me? You hadn't had any life yet. So there's something, you know, I'm a little, you know, God knew what he was doing. He's like, hey, here you go. She's the one. He's like, right on. He woke up. There she was. What do I name her? So she was called woman. And he saw that she was good, right? Um, God put them together, united them. And the Bible says in Genesis 2, they became one flesh, which means they had sexual relations. But they consummated the relationship that it represented a unity, a merging of two lives, physically, yes, but spiritually, absolutely. Now listen, that individually could not accomplish God's purpose, but only together could they accomplish God's purpose because they were now one. And then the Bible says they were naked and not ashamed. (laughs) And that's the way that we end that thought. You fast forward 1,500 years and you've got the apostle Paul talking to a church at Corinth that messed it up. I mean, you talk about messing it up. You think, oh, we got problems because we got the internet and we got cable TV and we got satellite and we got the gym and the world's just so hard for us to make. And, And they had it really, really hard back in the apostle Paul's day too. So hard that the way that they worshiped in Corinth at the temple of Aphrodite was through um, sex, prostitution. Young men would look forward to the day when they got to go to the temple, as you might imagine. When am I old enough to go to church with you, dad, right? And then at night, many historians would say that the prostitutes would come down out, off the mountain and walk on, knock on your door and go, hey, I hadn't seen you in a few weeks. You hadn't been to church, wanna worship? I mean, you talk about temptation, literally was dropped off at your door. And not only that, but sexual relationships outside of marriage were pervasive. You've read some of the stuff. We've talked about some of the stuff. It was a society that, um, well, let's just say that we're not the only ones that live in what we consider to be a progressive, liberal, some call it open-minded 
world with that kind of a view towards sexuality. The apostle Paul said, pump the brakes. God has something better. You have to choose whether you believe him or not. And in 1 Corinthians, he writes a very, very powerful, but very short section of scripture where he defines what the act of sex is and who it's for. And it's what the Bible says. Now you may get mad at me. Here's the general pattern. This is what happens. You hear what God says. Many people at some point in their life have not chosen to do what God says. And so guilt sometimes accompanies that. Shame often accompanies that. You look at me and you go, I don't believe what you're saying because I don't like the way it makes me feel. So you discount the messenger in turn discounting the message and you go and reinforce the fact that you probably did what you had to, that you're okay. And what I like to do is to take God at his word, to choose to be uncomfortable and to allow God to change me in the way I think and live based on his standard and his plan for my life. So you have to choose which approach you're going to take. But the apostle Paul describes what sex is and who it's for and what it isn't and who it's not for. Now I'm gonna spoil the ending by telling you that what the apostle Paul says, and he defines sexual intercourse or relations this way, that it is only for a man and a woman in a monogamous marriage relationship and should be saved unless and until that relationship. And you say, well, aren't there exceptions? Well, what if I love him? What if I'm lonely? What if they said they'd break up with me if I didn't, you know, follow through? Well, do you, I, I can't be out in the world. I can't go to part. I can't, I can't have friends. Aren't there exceptions? Isn't there some wiggle room? And the answer is no, there's no exceptions. There's no wiggle room. It's God's standard. Now, the good news is, is that Jesus forgives the God. He forgives that he gives second chances, that he restores, that he's a God of grace, proven that Jesus himself befriended a lady who was formerly a prostitute. And she became one of his disciples and he considered her a friend. So I'm not condemning you and I'm not throwing rocks at you and I'm not judging you because there's none of that that will ever occur inside these walls in this church as long as I'm here. But the standard is the standard. It's just what it is. And so we have to decide, yes, I agree. I believe the Bible or no, I don't. It's antiquated. It's outdated. And I'm just not, not on board. Let me read it to you. Flee from sexual immorality. Run from it. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, there's a lot going on here. But what the apostle Paul is saying is, is that your bodies, and he's gonna explain this in this passage and later, belong to the Lord. And what you're gonna see in a second as I read this, and I want you to listen, is that when you become a believer, the Holy Spirit of God indwells your life and he comes to live within you and permanently stays with you. So whatever you do with your body, you're doing with the Lord. And if that doesn't make you think, I don't know what will. That after we're saved, and you'll see this as I read, that we've been bought and paid for with a price having committed ourselves to Jesus, what we do with our bodies is his business and not ours anymore. Flee from sexual immorality. Don't stay and fight. Flee from it. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? That's what I just told you. He's in, in you with whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. And then if you read in your notes, you'll go on to see that he even addresses the specific issues that this church, that they were having with the temptations that they were facing. And in a sense, a paraphrase is that now you're a follower of Christ and Jesus has a standard the standard is not to control you, to rob your freedom, 
to take away your joy. That God's standard is to set you free, to put you at peace, and to fill you with joy. But you have to be willing to choose. Who do I trust? Now, the first half of the time we've spent, which is almost over, I wanted to explain and define what sex is in relation to who it's for. And I hope I've made that abundantly clear. In the next section, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what we're supposed to do, not just with our bodies, but with our minds. And as we fight the battle, well, for the real estate of our heart, for the orientation of our spirit, for the trajectory or direction of our lives. And I've just got to tell you on a personal note, I'm a little bit freaked out and it's not because I'm prudish and it's not because I'm disconnected and it's not because I'm out of touch. I don't think any of those things are true. It's because I'm a grandfather now and I've got a two and a half year old granddaughter and it scares me to death the world that she's gonna grow up in and the choices that she's gonna be forced to make. And I know that for her to choose what's right, to keep herself for marriage, to follow God's standard, even though it may mean that she's lonely, even though it may mean she's made fun of, even though it might mean that she's rejected, but to stay strong, to embrace God's standard, to be blessed, to find that freedom, to enjoy that peace. I want that for her more than anything else but you wanna talk about a deck that's stacked against someone and you face those same odds. Your kids do, you do, your friends, because we live in a world that wants nothing more than to destroy you and consume you with lust and an inappropriate, inappropriate expression of sexuality. So here's how I'm gonna end this section with hope. The Bible says that if we confess our sin, that Jesus, that he is faithful to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So what you've done yesterday, or perhaps even today, and you'll see not just with your bodies externally, but your minds and thoughts internally, that can be in the past. And you can begin to think and live a different way today. And I trust and I hope that that's the page that we're all gonna be on when we finish our time together in just a few minutes. Father. All right, we are gonna transition our thoughts now to your thoughts. And I want to just reinforce as we begin that God is concerned about your physical well being and what you choose to do with your bodies, but God's also concerned about your mental and spiritual well being and what you choose to do with your minds. And what we choose to do with our minds and with our eyes is a revelation or an indication of the condition of our heart. Now, I wanna remind you that the stuff I'm talking about is hard stuff to hear. Some of you have never heard it before. No one told you. Some of you have heard it and just decided to dismiss it a long time ago. Life happens, relationships happen, mistakes are made. It doesn't mean that it's okay, but it means that it happened. It's real. Nobody gets through life unscathed. Everyone has scars. Scars can make you resentful, regretful, and bitter, or they can make you beautiful and useful in the hands of the Lord. And so what I want is for us to look at the wounds of the past and allow those to become beautiful reminders of God's grace and to help us resolve to live a different way. But you have to choose um, as we address these things. We're talking now about what we do with our minds and we're getting right down to the nitty gritty of lust. And uh, Joy and I study for my messages together because I don't know how women think. I've told you that. I've been married a long time and I can tell you that I don't have, I mean, I, I, I can guess better now than I used to, but I still don't really know. And so I ask her a lot when we study. Uh, we listen to sermons together. We listen to commentaries and podcasts when we walk. And I ask her, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And so this one was a particularly interesting uh, week to study together um, because uh, she had a lot of fun with me. And so we were out walking around one day and, and she just out of the blue goes, what about her? 
And I said, what are you talking about? She goes, that one right there. And so I looked and she goes, you lust after her? And I'm like, I didn't even see her until you pointed her out, Joy. And so I'm looking away, right? And so we're walking, she goes, how about her? And so I'm like, oh, you got me again. You made me look, you know? And so she was kind of messing with me a little bit, but sort of reminding me um, that, um, that it's important and the kinds of things that we, we studied together. And whether or not a woman is as attracted physically as men are to the opposite gender, sometimes women are attracted to things that may not be physical, but certainly can lead you the wrong direction. Well, I just want a higher value guy than I have. I want somebody that makes more, somebody that is a better dad, somebody that's a better father, somebody that makes me happy, somebody who meets my needs. I wish my husband was like my friend's husband. I wish my boyfriend was like the one I had back in the day. And your minds and hearts can be filled with, with lust and things that point you in the wrong direction. Just as simply as a man walking through the mall who sees a woman who's showing a little too much skin and decides to take a snapshot and think about it later. A lust is a lingering thought that can become a character trait or a habit that pushes us away from who God wants us to be. So Jesus was concerned about it. And the Pharisees thought they had it down because they, they were like, well, we're not sleeping with anybody. We're not cheating with our wives. We're really sexually pure. But their minds went wild. And they said, it doesn't matter what I think. Looking's free. If I can check out the menu as long as I go home for dinner. You ever heard anybody say that? I've heard men say that who say they're Christians. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? You can't, I can't. I can't. The looking's not free for me, for me. If I'm honest with myself and you're only as strong as you are honest. But the Pharisees were saying this and the Jews were taught to believe this and early Christians were tempted to believe this. And, and so Jesus said, listen, your mind and what you see and what you think is really important. And he, he illustrates this in his sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. He says, you have heard, but I say, you shall not commit adultery. That's one of the 10 commandments and that's important. We've defined what adultery is. Any expression of sexual relationship outside of marriage. I'm gonna come back and define that again in a minute. But I tell you, and this was the revolutionary part, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now the word looks here literally means something more than just the word looks. Because if you look at someone accidentally and it's like, oops, um, we have a saying, it's kind of a dumb saying, but first one's free, right? It's an accident. You look back, it's on you. You look a third time, oh, it's really on you. First one's an accident. The word looks here means looks with intent, lingering look, looks and goes, wow. I'm just appreciating God's beauty, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, all sorts of things we tell ourselves. But Jesus is saying, perhaps you wanna lock down your mind and save it only for your spouse. If you have one or until or unless. Perhaps it's something reserved only for a man and woman put together by God to accomplish something better as a couple than they could ever accomplish themselves. Perhaps it will make you more free and more at peace than you've ever thought you could be, perhaps. And we say, oh no, there's no way he could be right. This is crazy talk. We say it today and they said it then. Jesus continues, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose a part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And then he goes on and says, if your right eye or right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away because it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, the, Jesus is not literally telling you to mutilate yourself if you have a problem with your eyes. Um, wouldn't that be funny or not funny, but I don't know, if we all took this seriously and all of us men came to church next week with an eye patch, right? We're like, oh man, um, it's not because only one eye would prevent you from lusting. We would lust double time with one eye and catch up and make up for the other one. It's not about that. It's about in Jewish society, the right eye and the right hand represented your best. Your ability to provide, your ability to defend yourself, your ability to fight, your ability to accomplish tasks. They assume most people were right-handed. The right eye was the dominant eye, even though that's not true for all of us. And what Jesus is saying is, is that what is it that's so important in your life? What place you go, what social media do you frequent, what shows do you watch, what conversations do you have, what office communications and text messages do you continue to allow? What is it in your life that's so important to you that you will not get rid of to grab a hold of God's standard? And he says, why wouldn't you cut off your right hand and throw it away? 
What if you can't use your phone in the way you're used to using your phone? What if you can't go to the gym in the way you're used to going to the gym? Well, I'm gonna go wherever I want to and I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do. Remember what the apostle Paul said, flee from it if it's an issue. Now, the problem is churches have been telling people what issues are for years and years and years. And I'm not about to do that because your issues are different than the people around you's issues and my issues. And the last thing I'm gonna do is legislate morality. The church I grew up in, the environment that I was surrounded with, they legislated morality without explanation. And it was full of don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. And I knew the don'ts and I could give you a list of them, but I very rarely heard the why. And the why is what brings freedom. The don't imprisons you in religion. And I get why people do it because they're scared. They don't want you to make mistakes. So they try to beat you over the head with all of the don'ts. But Jesus isn't really giving us don'ts here. He's really giving us a do. And it's a pathway to something that if we embrace and believe could lead us to a whole different perspective on life. And so he says, what you think matters, what you see matters, what you cultivate in your mind matters, what you carry with you matters. And what if, perhaps, what if the only sexual thought that you're supposed to have and entertain is the thought that's locked down to your relationship with your spouse? What would that be like? Impossible. In our strength, absolutely. Impossible. In God's strength, with God's help, he promises us that he'll get it done. Now, it may take until we die, I was hanging out with a guy a little older than me this week. And I was like, hey, does lust ever, you know, do you ever stop? You ever just, you know, do you ever outgrow it? He goes, oh yeah, I outgrew that 10 years ago. And I'm like, seriously? And he goes, no. He said, you never outgrow it. I, I had hope, maybe when I hit 65, maybe, you know, but I mean, it's just one of those things that we, that we deal with. And so what's the Bible say? It doesn't say combat, lust, toe to toe, fight it. You know, it says run from it, protect yourself. So the apostle Paul says that, an expression of sexual relationship outside of marriage is uniting yourself with somebody. That it's uniting yourself with somebody in the way that you're only intended to be united with one person. That's God's plan and his standard. Divorces happen, relationships happen, mistakes happen, life happens. As a reminder, I'm not throwing stones at you. I sit under God's word and his authority with you to decide what we do today moving forward, not to linger in yesterday and what we had wish we'd done differently. We're all on the same page? God is a God of redemption, a God of forgiveness, and a God of grace. So I have an acronym that I wanna give you that I think you might find helpful. And instead of saying unite, which many have in mind or deed with people other than a spouse, I wanna give you an acronym that's called untie. And the first one is gonna require some honesty and um some courage from you, is to understand, to understand the issue. The word adultery is related to the word adulterate. And I want you to pay attention to this. It means to render something poorer in quality by introducing or adding another substance. The more partners you have, the harder it is to have substance with the partner that you're with. If the partner that you're with is not your spouse, then you shouldn't be with that partner. If the man or woman who you happen to be with is pressuring you to violate God's standard, then they are not God's man or woman and you need to separate yourself because you, friend, are worth more than that. You're a child of God, you're valuable in his eyes and you can live a different way. And I'm not mad at you, I'm so for you. And I want us to get this so badly that it brings out passion in me. But literally what the Bible tells us is, is the more we give ourselves away, the harder it is to actually have that connection and the further we get from the intention that God had in the first place. And it seems hopeless. And so some people say, well, what's the point? I've already messed up. I mean, I'm, my mind is trash and my actions have been. So what's the point? The point is, is that God's given you today. So you have tomorrow that you can offer to God the rest of your life as a gift to him. And he can begin to restore into you what it is that you've given away because that's what God does. You can't know Jesus without knowing that Jesus is the God 
of second chances, regeneration. But we have to understand, it's voluntary sexual activity between a married man or woman and someone other than his or her spouse. Now, there are a couple other definitions that I want to give you. One, you've seen the definition of sex, and that's an important distinction. But the definition of lust, lust is any thought, any attitude or action that nudges you away from God's plan and his standard in your life, anything, which for you will be different perhaps than for me, but it's anything. So I encourage you to look at your life, which is where we're heading here in this acronym and take a a serious inventory as we begin to, to work past the you and move on to the end. Never take it lightly. Run from anything that causes you issues. Run from anyone that causes you issues. Run from any apps that cause you issue. Run from any friendships that cause you issue. Run from any former relationships that cause you issue. Run. If you have an issue, flee, run, get away. Why? Because it's the only way but you have to choose. It requires honesty. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Look at this last, please look at this with me. You've got to look at this this last sentence here. Enjoy the companionship of those who are committed to living the same way. If you're in a relationship with somebody who's not committed to living the same way, you're in the wrong relationship. If you're in a friendship where your friends are choosing not to live in this way and encouraging you to live in a different way, you're in the wrong friendships. Pursue righteousness. Pursue faithfulness. Pursue love. And pursue peace. All right. Untie. U-N-T. Think about today what you can prevent tomorrow. Job says in Job 31, one, I've made a covenant with my eyes to stay out of trouble. What are you gonna make a covenant with? You know, Pastor Dan and I have been friends a long time, long time since eighth grade. And we know each other. We have been through ups and downs, highs and lows, any of the ebbs and flows of life. I've seen him at his absolute worst. He's seen me at my worst. Perhaps we've seen each other at our best. And yet, even after knowing each other since eighth grade and trying to follow Jesus as best we can, we still protect each other in our own personal lives and hold each other accountable. Not because we're raging, uncontrolled perverts, but because we're men. And we know that if we're not careful, like 1 Corinthians says, and we think we stand, that we'll fall. Do you know that when Lori's out of town, that I text Dan and, or call him once in a while and just get in his business a little bit and just go, hey, what you doing? And he does the same thing for me. And you know, when he doesn't, I know he might. And the reason that we do that for each other isn't because we wanna be the church police for each other. It's because we love each other and we want the best for each other. And we want each other to win. I want him to have the best marriage he can possibly have. And he wants that for me. He wants our minds to be pure and only for our spouse. And I, I want that for him. And so there are things in our lives that we eliminate that we know are problems and things that I probably should eliminate that I've been working on with God going, where are the triggers? Where are the problems? But think about today what you can prevent tomorrow. Because why in the world would you choose tomorrow to deal with a temptation you could solve today by just telling yourself no? All right, what's the next one? I, involve Jesus in your battle and include a trusted friend. I kind of gave away the trusted friend part a little early but you heard what I said, but you got to involve Jesus in your battle. This is what it looks like for me. God, we live in a world that could not be any more set up against mental and sexual purity than the one we live in. You literally can't open your phone. You can't turn on the TV. You can't go to the gym. You can't go to the mall. You can't go outside. You can't do anything without running smack into it. Things that could potentially be a temptation God, it's a world that makes it hard for us to be men and women of character and purity. 
And we can't just separate from the world, go live in a desert, be monks. People have tried that. And do you know what? It doesn't work. Sin follows us no matter where we go. But I get up in the morning, every morning, and I pray this prayer. It's a simple prayer, but this is the one I pray. God, help me today to get it right. Because if you don't help me, I'm not going to get it right. It being everything. I pray this. God, help me to see your opportunities today. Because if you don't help me see them, I'm going to miss them. I'm going to be busy today. I got things to do. Help me to get it. Because I'll get to the end of the day and I will have accomplished what I want, but I will have missed the point of my life. And that requires a mind that's focused on God without distraction. And purity is a huge part of that. Psalm 66 tells us that if we linger and allow things like this in our mind, that it gets in the way of God hearing and answering our prayers. So how seriously do you want to take it? Because nobody can make you do it. That's the thing. It can exist in here and in here and nobody can see it. Now, eventually it's gonna come out in your closest relationships and will eke out through your character. But for a long time, nobody will know it's just you. So this is one of those big boy, big girl things. How seriously do you want to take it? What's the next one? Expect that God will give you freedom, even if it takes a while. And according to my friend, who's about 15 years older than me, it takes a while. But what in life that's important or worth it doesn't take a while? What's not difficult? What's not hard? What if accomplishing your purpose in life revolves around something as simple as you being in control of your mind and your thoughts when it comes to this issue of sex, adultery, and lust. What if? I'm just asking. You can say it's not, that I'm crazy, the Bible's outdated. I get it. I'm just asking what if. Now, remember last week. We're almost done. Remember last week. Last week, I talked to you about self-control. Last week was gluttony. I had all sorts of interesting conversations after my message to you guys last week, and I loved them. Most of them were good conversations. And I just want to give you a tip that's for free. Um, when we talked about food, and you're like, oh, come on, you're crazy with food. I want to give you a test you can do. Nothing has nothing to do with lust, adultery, and sex. This is just the test you can do. Before you eat something, squeeze it, okay? Uh, you want a donut, a Krispy Kreme? Grab that thing and squeeze it as hard as you can. And then when you see what comes out of it, then decide if you want to eat. It. You want, I mean, do that with everything you eat. Buy two, squeeze it really hard. If you can't do it, have somebody else do it. When you see the junk, ask yourself, would I inject that into my arteries, into my, to my body? Uh, just see, just, just te- put it to the test. That's all. Now, back to the point, we talked about self-discipline last week. We talked about making sure that we choose today what's going to help us become who it is that we want to become tomorrow. Choose between what I want now and what I want most in life. And, and so I want to remind you the two questions that we kind of closed last week with, and we're going to close this week with them too. What do you want most in your life? What if you wanted sexual purity in your thoughts and your actions? What if we said, I want to honor God with my mind and my body from now on? Because I want more than what the world has given me. I want more than what my choices have afforded me. What if that's what you wanted more than anything else? We're the sum total of the choices we've made and we can change by making different choices. So that leads me to my second question. What are you going to choose to do now or not to do now? What are you gonna put down? What are you gonna turn off? What are you gonna eliminate? Who are you going to say bye to? What relationship are you going to start so you have someone who'll watch your back and help you win? What are you going to choose to do now to get it tomorrow? Because if you don't do something now, it will likely become one of your life's biggest regrets. And we're taught to flee from lust, not fight it. Okay, you ready for the last two? I know I said I'm almost done. I really mean I have two statements to leave you. And the last one is the most important, the most powerful. It's the thought that I want to invade your mind and your heart all week long. This is the first statement. I've already said it to you twice this morning. You are only as strong as you are honest. And some of you right now are lying to yourself and you've been lying to the people closest to you. You have to decide. 
Now here's the one, this is the bomb, this is the take home. What if God is calling you into a bigger and more beautiful story than the one you write for yourself? What if, just listen, what if? I know you're saying no way, but what if? What if the story that God is writing in your life is so much more beautiful, so much more purposeful, so much more filled with peace and freedom than the one you could ever write for yourself. What if, but we keep taking the pen and saying, no, God, I don't trust you. I don't believe you. You don't know what you're talking about. I have to write this chapter and we mess it up. We take ourselves for a long walk into nowhere and we leave ourselves for dead. And God says, hand me the pen and just trust me. Hang your life in the balance of what if and let me prove it to you. But we have to decide. Well, that's a lot for today, isn't it? And it's very hard to read you. <laughs> and so that's probably okay. I'd love to have personal conversations with each of you and really find out what this means. But my prayer is that somewhere along the way, something has stuck. Not because I've been speaking and not because I've done a good job. My prayer this morning was, God, let me get the information out without messing it up so my friends can hear your truth and make a decision. I feel that I've done that. And I want you to decide. Now, I wanna caution you, you can't decide with willpower alone because you will fail. But if you throw yourself, well, decide to be dependent on God and ask him for the desire and the strength and the ability to follow through. My friend, he'll bring peace and freedom in your life as he writes the story and creates a beautiful ending to your life. Perhaps, what if, why not? Father, thank you for the time we've spent together. And I just pray that the message would land today, wherever you want it to land, whether those listening online or those in this room in the first service, all of us sit under the authority of your word and compare ourselves to Jesus and we have fallen short. All of us guilty of the actions or the attitudes or the thoughts or all of the above. Regret is about yesterday. But now that we know, now that we've been faced with the truths that come from your word and the hope that lies within living a different way. I pray that we would choose the what if, that we would rely on your strength, that we would depend on your leadership, your friendship, your love, your direction, that you would write a masterpiece, a beautiful conclusion to our lives as we each week continue to give more and more of ourselves back to you. I love my friends, Father, and I want this for us more than anything. And I know you do too. So it's in Jesus' name I pray it, amen.